Gustavo Adolfo Ribe here, and on this episode of The Whiteboard, I'm going to do a history of Western music in a nutshell. So, Western music history in a nutshell. <laughs> Alright, why is this important? Um, it's good to know, man. Obviously, I'm not going to cover every single fucking thing, but at least point you in the right direction, and then you can, like, study it further um, on your own time. This is kind of interesting, like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, musicians or whatever, and, you know, they don't um, know shit about the history of music, and, I mean, it is kind of important, man, you know? Okay. Let's just get through it. Fuck it. See how it goes. <clears throat> if you see me wearing the same shirt in the videos, it's because, fuck it, I'm just doing them back to back to back, alright? <laughs> um, okay, Western music, music history in a nutshell. Real Western music history as we know it today started with the church, okay? With the monks. Um... Basically, um, they had a, um, uh, you know, text, right? Sacred, you know, text. And the tradition was that they would recite the text, you know, blah, 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 to an audience, right? Recite text to the audience. You know, like a mass or whatever. Uh, and then these monks, uh, they started to write stuff down so it could help other monks um, kind of uh, learn, uh, know how to how to recite the music. So this is in the middle Middle Ages, right? Um, this is important because, um, you know, music, how it was before the Middle Ages, we don't really know because, you know, the Middle Ages happened and everything went to shit and the fall of Rome and all that fucking shit and then all the burning of libraries and fuck. <laughs> but anyways, they started to develop this thing and basically... They started to develop... Uh, writing music, Western notation, and what they would do is they would have like little squares, and then the the words like right here, and then have like little squares, um, and then that started to develop, and then they started using like you know circles and and staffs and you know shit like that the way we see it today, but it, originally. If you look at um, the original, like, monk stuff, it looks really fucking weird. <laughs> and you have to, like, study how to actually interpret that. <clears throat> so now, so they're starting to develop this shit, right? With the, the monks. And uh, what they start to develop is um, this thing where... They have, you know, usually it was like everybody singing the same line, but then they started to experiment and they started to develop counterpoint, contrapunctus in Latin or something like that. Contrapunctus. And basically that's counterpoint. That's literal translation. And basically they would have the, the notes 
like different notes, you know, at the same at the same time, and then one guy would would recite the bottom line, which is called the cantus firmus. Fir, fuck, firmus, or the the firm line, the foundation, or firmus. I don't fucking remember. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so they would do this line, and then the guy above that would do the top line, right? So then you start to have counterpoint, all right? So then later, um, like around the Baroque period, <clears throat> you start to have, you know, you got to remember, throughout these periods, they would have things called treaties, which is basically a guideline of how to write music and stuff. And a lot of different monks wrote a whole bunch of shit. So if you study counterpoint, <clears throat> like the history of counterpoint, there's all kinds of treatises and they all had different rules and blah, blah, blah. And it's like a fucking mess, right? But what happens is there's basically like two kinds of theories that kind of come along, right? And, uh, this is kind of tricky, but, um, we start to get theory of harmony, of functional harmony. So, for example, like with Bach, Bach, you know, the composer J.S. Bach, so he starts to do all kinds of crazy shit, right? And then you got four-part harmony, which is S-A-T-B, which is stands for soprano, alto, alto, tenor, bass, right? Four, and it's straight, it's still in the church, right? And then then they're developing all this. He's you know, and then he he's not the like the only one who did it, but like he took it to like another level, right? But he actually wasn't that famous in his day. It was actually Mendelssohn that like another famous composer like uh, he they kind of rediscovered it and started playing his music and then it became more like cool you know but interesting interesting note so anyways so they started to do this this like you know different voices right and what happened was uh, what ha happened was <laughs> that they started to develop theories of like okay well uh, let's this shit called figured bass, right? Which was basically, well, that's was what Bach was doing, figured bass. So he would have like numbers, like six, four, one, something, blah, 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 blah. And basically he was counting the space between the, 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 the bass line to the second note to the, to the third note. And that's basically what figured bass is. And then you, you start to, to see uh, chord inversions, right? <clears throat> but it wasn't until like this, I think it was a French guy, Rousseau or something like that, or Rameau, I don't fucking remember, but basically the French guy, he's like, you know what, there's a theory to this, there's a functional theory, and that's when they started to do like, um, well, you know, the figured bass would have that, and they would have Roman numerals, and basically what they were saying was like started to develop this thing with like scales and and um, you know harmony and functional harmony and blah 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 so that's kind of like the stem of what uh, uh, classical music and beyond was so that was like the foundation in the Baroque period baroque um and a lot of the forms and stuff uh that like bach wrote in or whatever you, there's like two different ways of looking at it there's secular which is like the dances the dances of like the peasant dances and they're all based on dances pretty much they're all based in dance uh, and then you got the the sacred which is church music, which is based on text, religious text. <clears throat> so when you have composers write like requiems, that's like a death mass, or like 
some type of mass it's it's religious sacred religious or they'll have like uh, some type of dance then it's secular right it's kind of interesting and important because composers throughout the western music they take their different cracks at it different ways and then what happens is basically the um the instruments <clears throat> They start to develop. And you have the, the courts. The courts play a huge part, right? So first it was like the church that was kind of moving things along. Now it's the courts, okay? And the courts, they, they have like their own little chamber orchestras where they get a bunch of like, you know, violins and trumpets and shit like that. And what happens is uh, the instruments start to develop. They start to become better and better and better. And at the time of the Baroque, um, like, for example, certain horns, like you had to detach certain parts of the horn and, and, and use different parts. And it was a fucking mess, but they couldn't change keys that easily. Um, meaning that if they're in a certain uh, key or pitch, like everything around that pitch is 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 the harmonies, right? Because of the overtone series in, in physics. So what happens is is that naturally instruments they they can't they can only if they're tuned to a certain like you see like in the concerts where they start to tune their instruments, they're actually tuning the their uh, to specific pitches right that's kind of like in a sense somewhat arbitrary because um in in real physics uh depending on the instrument they cannot the, the way the instruments are made they cannot play a perfect overtone series with another instrument depending on how they're made so for example like Horns have like a real problem with this, right? Um, because you have to actually attach different tubes to get the right pitches. <clears throat> with strings, all you have to do is move your finger a little bit and you could adjust. So it's a lot easier to adjust. But basically, the whole point that I'm getting that is that these instruments started to improve, right? And all of a sudden, you start to get a, a fucking... Um, uh, equal temperament or mean temperament and then an equal temperament so they kind of are all on the same page and that's when you start to get things really evolving in in uh in the, the instruments and with the uh, orchestrations and the all that shit and what happens is something that in the baroque develop opera so the quartz develop opera they start to develop opera and opera is basically work a work a work right and uh it develops in italy um and you got some some baroque opera composers and it starts to spread out they're like oh this shit's pretty cool and basically opera incorporates uh a play music dance uh, theater it incorporates a play uh, music and dance with through a theater so it's combining all of this shit that's what I call it it's a work you know um, so you can have the, the 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 play of the plot or whatever the, it's like sung to music and then there's dancing to it so and there's and it's theatrical so it's, all, it's like all of the performing arts are combined into the opera. So now what happens is the opera becomes so popular that all throughout Europe they start to develop opera houses. <clears throat> this is like in the um, in the classical era of music. So these big ass opera houses because opera houses become an equivalent to 
uh, what today we would call um, a movie theater. It's kind of like that. Like people would go to the movies, people would go to the opera, and it was basically like like that. Um, let me get some coffee going a second. <clears throat> so this is a big fucking deal. So 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 basically, all the music that's developed is basically centered around this opera um, um, aesthetic. So so a lot of things develop. Uh, voice voice technique where instead of like the monks just you know all like singing together they're kind of like har harmonizing but in the opera you got like soloists and they got to project to the opera house to the back of the theater so they develop the techniques to really project their voice that's why opera singers sound like oh the reason is because they didn't have microphones back then so if you think opera sounds weird it's because you're not you don't understand that it was made in the era of opera houses where you had to project your voice where they didn't have microphones. Nowadays, everybody has a fucking microphone and the voice technique is depending on their training, bro. You know, not to say that opera um, voice technique is superior to other voice techniques, but that's when they really like, okay, let's really maximize the, the, the voice technique and they really figured out how can we really get this shit um, to th this maximum, maximum uh, volume potential in a sense and they started to do all kinds of shit and there's like uh, different uh, vocal styles and it really gets very in depth depending on your uh, physique um, the type of roles of the opera you know like a dramatic or whatever or like a light role and then there's different um, uh, you know, like sopranos, you know, the oh, 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 like very like agile vocal writing. It's very, very deep, right? So anyways, they start to develop vo voice technique and they start to develop orchestration. So now you got like really big time <clears throat> opera. Opera is the shit, right? So Mozart's writing operas and then you know Beethoven he tried to write an opera it was like Fidelio it's not as it was like only his his only opera and it wasn't that successful but then you got then you get uh, moving along you know you got um, the big the big heavyweights was like you know like Berlioz and Wagner and um, uh, you know the, the Italian um, composers and they start to make really, really big orchestrations, big, op bigger opera houses, bigger orchestras, and they start to write books about like how to do orchestration technique. So, so voice technique and orchestration starts to really develop around this period. <clears throat> okay, so then you got you got composers like Schubert, and what he, what his Schubert and Schumann. Now we're in the like romantic period we're talking about, and what happens in this period is like I said, the opera houses were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and another thing happens: the rise of the middle class because they got money to go to the operas and all this shit, and they start to they start to buy pianos. Okay, piano forte is invented, and it's like a really big deal. And why this is a big deal is because for the first time. You can essentially get an orchestra in your house. Why? Because it has like, you know, a wide range. Like pianos have 88 keys, right? So they have a lot of range and you can, the harder you press the, the, um, the note, the louder, the louder it gets or the softer it gets. So you have uh, volume dynamics. This is huge. This is a fucking big deal because pianos before that, they didn't have that. They were like, it was like plucking a harp, but on a keyboard. With this, you can actually get a whole bunch of sound. So it was like, like I said, an orchestra in your living room. 
and then these guys, Schubert, Schumann, you know, th these types of guys, and um, uh, let's say Chopin, they start to write for the, you know, piano, like, exclu not, kind of exclusively, like Chopin, like, maybe he wrote like one cello, sonata, or something like that, but almost exclusively for the piano. So you get this really wide range of developments. There's like the, the piano development, and you start to get like songs, lighter in German, or leader, I don't fucking know, whatever. <laughs> it was like songs that you play in your living room with the piano, right? Um, so this, why is this important? Because this is the birth. <clears throat> There's two things that happen. You got leader or lighter. And then you got you got opera, and basically via the piano, and you got um, uh, you know get-togethers in the living room. You get the birth of the pop song. This is the actual roots of the pop song, okay? <clears throat> and then it develops in America, but we'll go into that. So hold your horses. <laughs> now, an important thing happens in music history, Western music history. It's a World Fair and Debussy. Um, basically, he goes to the World Fair, he hears Gamelan music, I think it was, or Javanese music or whatever, and they use a lot of pentatonic type of scales, but they have their own, like, you know, system. But anyways, he listens to it, and he starts to work with, he starts to develop this whole tone and pentatonic uh, vocabulary in his music. So you got Debussy, oops, and whole tone, and pentatonic. Now the reason this is important is because at his, at that time in in western music no one was really doing that shit. It was really just functional harmony, tonic, the dominant, the blah 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 blah. But this opened up kind of like a Pandora's box because with whole tone uh scales um you're kind of in an essence uh, doing a very symmetrical scale um, and each note has some type it, the functional harmony doesn't really apply that much anymore so that's why it's really important um, and, and, and it starts to change the way composers thought so you have different kinds of music now okay so now here's, here's, here's where we're going to transition to America right So what happens? Well, um, you know, Europe start to colonize every fucking thing in America, and then what happens is you have. Hold on, let me open the window real quick. It's actually getting really stuffy in here, uh, and I need to be able to breathe. <laughs> So I apologize if the noise gets, um, let me check my focus on my camera and my notes here. Um, just a second. Okay, so keep we're keeping rolling. So what happens is, here's America, you know, here's like Mexico and South America and the Caribbean. Okay, and then here's, uh, you know, Africa, and then Europe, and then India, the Mediterranean. Okay, this is, okay. So what do they do, right? They start to, Europe goes to Africa. It starts to export um, slaves, right? Slave trade. So they go to the Caribbean, and then they, you know, drop them off in America, and shit like that right 
Now here's the interesting thing that happens in American musical music history. What ends up happening, I don't know why, but why this is the case, but for some reason in English speaking colonies, the drums of the, the African people, they were banned. <clears throat> Hold on. So that was like drums banned so like you know like jamaica and stuff and in and, and the americas they banned the african people's drums i don't know why because in the in the latin countries like spanish and portuguese colonies they were able to keep their drums i mean if you're like a historian and you know the exact reason, you can put a put a link in the comment, whatever. But I don't really fucking know. I mean, theoretically, um, the drums, I guess they banned them because they didn't want them to start revolutions, because there was a lot of revolutions like in Haiti and shit like that, um, and they wanted to, you know, keep them down. And then that's something interesting happens. And you get North America and South America. You know, the Latin speaking and the English, right? I'll just say English and Latin. That makes more sense. <clears throat> now, in the, in the Latin countries, they keep their drums and they mix with European influences and shit and they develop salsa music as we know it today which is salsa is an umbrella marketing term that was created in New York um, to for market these types of music but basically it's like a whole bunch of different like Cuban music and now we have a um, you know uh, in the in the canon of the Latin you know music canon, there's like you know Brazilian and um, there's you know Dominican. You got merengue and and bachata, you know, and then you Brazilian. Well, it's kind of like its own thing, but very similar. Has all kinds of shit. And then uh, in the Spanish um, type of Latin music, they're kind of more like in the canon like and they'll play them at parties and stuff the brazilian stuff that's kind of like a different entity but out of that you get like bossa nova and all kinds of shit man brazil's a pretty pretty big country and they have lots of different kinds of stuff um but yeah so you got that type of music that is developed um but you also have uh the roots also another type of root of African music, which is the, the um, clave and the coro. And the clave is basically uh, in 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 uh, Spanish-speaking Latin music um, is either two three or three two. It's the same thing. It's just different ways of looking at the pattern, but it's basically uh, a hemiola of um, three over four basically so if you have like one two three four and go da 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 that's african music is is that's basically the aesthetic of it and the clave pattern is like or and it's basically outlining that hemiola pattern that's basically what it is and it goes deeper but as a composer point of view that's basically what it is and then the coro uh, which is the call and response call and response call and response and you get that in the Latin, in the Latin music you hear it <clears throat> so in the in the English one 
because they didn't have their drums, they really focus on that call and response, and they develop uh, the slave song, which is basically like, and then like people would call and response and stuff like that, and then you know uh, uh, they develop blues music, okay. And blues is basically the slaves playing the banjo and singing. It's basically what it was. <clears throat> um, and the weird thing is, like, they have, like, the stringed instrument thing in Africa, but they also had, like, the banjo, which was, like, kind of like a, a northern uh, European instrument, whatever. But what they did was they made, they made like, makeshift banjos. Um... And uh, they they started singing. And this is a cool book. Um, check out my my Amazon uh, uh, book list. There's I have a book um, uh, African American music by Earl Stewart. Is my uh, teacher at UCSB. One of my teachers. Very good, uh, cool guy. Cool book. And he also has this other one, Vernacular Harmony. It's in the list uh, for harmony. And I'll make another video on harmony. But anyways, check that out. So that's basically what it was. Now here's here's the thing. Now what happens is uh, you got all these influences, which is uh, marching band, which is a European thing, and you got uh, the the pop song. You know the lighter slash opera stuff, and you like Tin Pan Alley. They're starting to make songs that you could play at home, right? And you got the blues. And all of these influences, they develop into jazz. <clears throat> and jazz is basically like the marching, like they'll have like a marching band, like they take that marching band and like they turn into like a swing band or whatever. And they play blues and they also play those pop songs and they just kind of mix it and that's where you start to get like uh, uh and now we're in, and again like 1920s 1930s with the recording pre-world war ii era and swing was king right now here's another interesting thing that happens in jazz is that they started to get musically sophisticated. Why? Because they were influenced <clears throat> by Debussy. Kind of weird the way it works out, but that's what happened. Uh, you know, they started to get, to get the recordings and shit like that and blah, 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 blah. And, they're, and that whole tone and that penta, pentatonic uh, that type of vocabulary, um, they start to, to incorporate that in the jazz harmonic language and you start to get, you know, sevens, nines, elevens, thirteens, a lot of shit get incorporated into the jazz uh, idiom. Um, so anyways, so what happens in jazz is that <clears throat> with the increase in harmonic complexity it becomes a tradition to reharmonize songs so now you start to get the pop song starts to evolve Okay, it evolves through jazz. Now here's where shit gets really crazy. <laughs> After World War II, like 50s and stuff, something happens. Something out of left field. And it's like actually a stem of jazz 
um, of the boogie woogie era, the swing. But anyways, it evolves into rock and roll. And basically, it's kind of like, like if jazz consolidated everything, rock and roll kind of simplified certain things and certain elements and became its own kind of identity. Um, and rock and roll basically means sex, if you didn't know that already. And what happens is white people start like, first they like the swing music and they start doing that shit. Then they, this thing came out, and they're like, oh shit, let's do that shit too. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? So rock and roll, you got Elvis and uh, the Beatles, basically, and they start running with that shit. And that's where you get uh, West... Oh, another thing. So this is World War II. Um, what happens during World War II is the development of microphones, uh, recording technology. So you got condenser mics you know like the uh, no Neumann Telefunken and you got tape and these things transformed the uh, recording industry because at first everything was broadcast through radio now because of these uh, recording technology they were able to produce the recording industry and the rock and roll shit took off because now you got jukeboxes uh, and now you don't, you know what I'm saying? And uh, um, it, it just everything changed. So, okay, so to sum up, I had uh, issues with the focusing. I don't know what the hell happened there. But anyways, to sum it up, we got European folk songs, uh, which is like acoustic. Um, stuff and then kind of like Bob Dylan type stuff uh, rock and roll and jazz and these other influences so that's how you get like where we're at today um, and then uh, then there's some other another stream that comes along so I'm gonna go into the uh, funk and disco hip-hop development <clears throat> so a couple of things happen because of the recording technology now you got records right and then you got DJs and then you got James Brown records and he develops funk so and then you got disco records so something interesting happens. You got James Brown records and that develops into hip hop musics, hip hop music um, via the DJs, right? And then like, and then the late 70s, 80s in New York, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you had a lot of Jamaican influence there because the Jamaican culture had a block parties and they would play DJ uh, DJs would play music and they took that to New York Jamaica Queens you know and that's where you start to get hip-hop music uh, where they would play a lot of James Brown music and then they would take the break beats from those records and then they would start to rap on them right now the funny thing is a similar thing kind of happened uh, the, dis the disco right disco era but then that evolved into house music um, because via the, the 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 gay clubs, the black gay clubs in Chicago and New York, they were playing. You know, they developed. You know. Uh, um, that disco sound and they started experimenting blah 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 and then you got records that were solely for like disco like for clubs um, and and that's house music that's where the, the the name house music comes from because it was the house music you know the DJ started to produce shit 
and it was the house. If I'm, I might be wrong here, but I think that's what it is. Um, uh, and then they would have like house of this house. Of, well, anyways, whatever. The point is, is that now you got uh, a house music and hip hop have have now evolved into EDM, which is electronic dance music. So now we're doing this video in 20, 2016. And of course it gets more de more detailed than this, but it's like house, then the techno, and all this fucking shit. But basically these hip hop and house is the development of the DJs. And the DJs, um, it, it really came from uh, the developments in the recording technology where, with the invention of the, the long play record and the, the developments in quality um, and then recorded music and the clubs and stuff like that so um, so hip hop is kind of like from the street from the block parties and then the discos from the clubs and then they've kind of fused and integrated and I got this EDM type music which is basically electronic dance music so that's where we're at we're at today and that's Western music history in a nutshell um, of course if there's anything that you would like me to cover more in depth you know shoot me a comment or an email um, or if I made any mistakes or whatever put that in the comment you know, it's we're all here to learn, you know, so um, I hope that video was helpful to you. Um, thanks for watching.